friends here we are um hi everybody thanks for watching we're going to be talking about writing science for the stage with three of my absolute favorite writers um i'd like to welcome anna ziegler and charlie von simpson mm -hmm. and Gita reddy hi all hello hello um hi. i'm lauren gunderson pronouns she her hers i'm in san francisco right now which is slightly on fire at the moment but a little smoky here today. Um, <clears throat> it is Ohlone land. Um, so I'd love to have everybody introduce yourselves. I'll kind of popcorn it around. Um, and what I'd love, I kind of like to start these things for all of you out there watching there. Y'all are all writers out there. So we're all really interested in kind of the practical how to's like what is real advice writer to writer about um, not just writing science, but how you have a career and et cetera. So I'd love to start. Um, Charlie, why don't you start us off sure. and tell us kind of how do you come to be you? How do you find the theater? How are you here today? Yes. Um, um, so I'm Charlie. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I am in Brooklyn, New York. Um, how, how did I come to theater? Um, uh, that's a funny. It's not a funny question at all. It's really simple. Um, I uh, was a kid who spent a lot of time by myself, uh, basically with my mom, just me and her. Um, and I read a lot of books and I watched a lot of movies. Um, and there was this miraculous time when um, I sort of realized that theater was kind of like a movie on stage. <laughs> um, and so I could do these, these things called plays um, and sort of live out my best. I was really obsessed with Julia Roberts so I could live out my best Julia Roberts dreams um, on a stage. Um, and so that's sort of how I came to, to the theater. And it was only really in college when, uh, I feel like friends of mine were like, hey, like you do theater and you love to write. There are these things called playwrights and they write plays. Maybe you should try that. Um, and it was, you know, it was in college when I started taking some classes and had some really lovely teachers who were grad school, uh, grad students at the time who were sort of like, you have a knack for it. You understand how sort of this works. Um, and then I promptly graduated and did not do theater for a few years um, until a good friend of mine called. Um, I was in a Masters of Social Work program I was halfway through working at a camp with kids on the autism spectrum and with emotional support needs. And um, she called and she's like, that's great, um, but we're supposed to be writers. Why aren't you writing? Um, and that was, I think at this point, maybe nine years ago. Um, and I've been just trying to write ever since. <laughs> mm. Awesome. That's amazing that you were doing mm. Masters of Social Work. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I, there's, I miss it a little bit. Um, you know, mm. I still like kind of have the dream of going to, to finish it. Um, but I think it informs a lot of what I think about. So yeah, that, that helps me see your work in a whole new light. <laughs> um, Gita, tell us about you. How do you come to be you? Uh, hey, hi, I'm Geetha Reddy. I'm, uh, I'm also on a lonely land just a little south of uh, Lauren where we're totally getting smoked out. So my apologies if I'm a little hoarse. Um, so I came quite, I came quite late to theater, um, I think comparatively. Uh, I was involved with the arts in college, but I really was a science person and um, studied astronomy and physics um, and then worked in uh, Silicon Valley for 10 years, I had my kids. And then I kind of like had an early midlife crisis and was like, what am I doing? Um, and really started thinking about like early, my earlier ambitions before I kind of was like, oh, I have to do something serious, you know, something appropriate and um, <laughs> that will get me a job. And I entered, I took a class at an extension class and the people from that class started um, entering a 10 minute uh, play competition in uh, the Bay Area called Playground, which is a great organization. And uh, they they announce a prompt and you have to quickly wait in uh, five days and then they do a live stage reading and they would sometimes get, and they continue to get some of the best directors and actors in the Bay Area uh, to come and do it. So I started entering, I, I won several times. They commissioned a full length play for me. They commissioned another one. And slowly this thing that um, had started as a hobby became a career. Uh, and I think it was those early experiences of, um, you know, the, I think it's really the audience that changed me from being a dilettante into a professional, you know, that, that thing of like seeing your work in front of an audience the first time, hearing them laugh, and then re also realizing the power you have over the audience and that you can like slowly shift them and then take them this way. Um, it was a thing I became kind of addicted to and continue to feel a little addicted to. Love it. Amazing. Thank you. Hi, Anna. 
tell us about you. Hi, um, I'm Anna, uh, she, her, hers. Um, I am currently in um, the Berkshires, but I live in Brooklyn. Um, and, and I guess that's sort of where my playwriting story starts because I went to a school called St. Anne's, which is a, a very arty um, school, uh, much more common to come out of St. Anne's um, a poet than an, an eye banker. <laughs> um, <sighs> But uh, I didn't write. I didn't write plays um, uh, there until I was in high school. I was I was a very serious poet, um, and and through I think through high school, I think up until twelfth grade, um, I was very focused. I was focused solely on that. But there was a playwriting class, and and I think my my mother takes credit for this. She said she you know she suggested I do it because I. Um, I have a lot of, I had a lot of dialogue in my, in my poems, um, and they seemed a little play-like. Um, so I took that class and I, I would like to say like, I fell in love with it and that was that, but, um, it was, it was certainly, um, fun. And, you know, I think I, even then, like, you know, you had your little play performed at the end of the year in front of an audience. And I, I remember the terror of sitting there <laughs> watching my play performed. And that is still what I experienced to this day. Um, so <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a preview that was, that was very um, um, accurate. Uh, but so I went to college and, and still was writing poetry very seriously. I thought I would come out of college, you know, and maybe work in publishing and write poetry on the side. But um, I ended up taking another playwriting course at the end of my time there. Um, and Arthur Copet taught that course. Um, cool. And I didn't have a play. I think you were supposed to apply with a play and I didn't have one. So I applied with a poem and he let me in. Um, and then um, kind of changed the course of my life because I, uh, I, I, I went after that, after I graduated from college, I went and did and wrote poetry for a year in England on a fellowship. But then he kind of suggested that I apply to NYU where he was teaching in the graduate program at the time and um, kind of like a dope I didn't really think that going to playwriting graduate school would necessarily lead um, here I, I, I think I thought like that sounds like a kind of fun thing to do and I don't know what I'm doing and I um, I wasn't I didn't get a publishing job like right out you know right away and so so I went to graduate school and um, and and at graduate was, school at NYU, right? At NYU, yeah, yeah. Right. Me yeah. Too. yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's right. I think you were just like a couple years. Yeah, behind, a couple right? years behind you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. With Tasha Gordon Salmon. Indeed. Um, Hi, Tasha. Oh, you love Tasha. Hi, Tasha. Uh, Tasha was the first. Was the assistant director on my first produced play. She's such a good. Um, she's a great playwright as well. But she's she's she brilliant at all things. And like, wears them all well. Where's yeah. Tasha? We got to text her right. Anyway. <laughs> um, um, cool. Yeah, and so then I kept writing plays after that because I discovered how hard it was <laughs> to write a good play and just kept wanting to write a better one. Um, oh, that's such a, that's such like the perfect way to describe a career in the theater. You just keep trying to do it better. Just than the torture last time yourself you over and over again, um, knowing uh, you will never achieve what you want to achieve. No, that's, oh, that's wow. basically it. Yes, this is great. <laughs> oh God, I'm going to go to sleep now. Um, okay. Thank you. That's awesome. So, I mean, what we're here to talk about, all of you have written really incredible, really different plays um, that deal with science. And I get this question asked all the time. Some of my earliest plays were ones at science, so I kind of like have that label for me for all of my career. Um, and I am fascinated with it. I love science on stage. I love history on stage. Often those are the same thing. Um, <clears throat> and you know, when you talk about history and when you talk about science, you inherently talk about politics and you talk about feminism and racism and all the isms that we're exposing and what do these activities do. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, before we talk about like how you do it, um, I'm going to throw out a couple of plays so that those out there who may have heard them or read them or seen them can kind of know what we're talking about. Gita has a wonderful play called On a Wonderverse. We also wrote a play about Henrietta Lacks called Gila um, together. Uh, Anna's amazing play, Photograph 51, and Charlie's extraordinary play, Behind the Sheet. Um, and they all are talking about different kinds of science, um, chemistry and medicine and physics and 
biology um, and uh, you know a lot of a lot of astronomy on my end. Um, so I, I'm really interested in kind of what how you found these subjects and was it a quest to write science? Was it just a you discovered this story reading a cool book or kind of how you found your way in? Of course, Gita like actually is like a legit like science tech yeah. person. So <laughs> maybe we'll start with Gita, the actual science nerd in our in our in our bunch. I, mean, I, I think I, I have a different approach um, than, than actually you do, Lauren. And I think that was part of the fun of our collaboration is that I'm much more interested in not so much uh, the history of the science, but what the science is mm. and um, where it's pointing forward. And like, like the epistemological questions of like how the science was done. Yeah. Um, and that actually brings up a lot of interesting political and issues too around it and seeing how the science is being done and who's doing it and, um, and the questions they're asking. And then of course the questions they're not asking. Um, so I kind of, I, you know, I, it's one thing I really um, bemoan about the American theater is that it seems like people don't really want science fiction, but I really like that kind of futurism in yeah. plays and, um, the way I kind of have snuck it in is bringing in like a lot of Hinduism has to do with a lot of the ideas and uh, science too is like uh, bringing it in with some uh, with uh, with my cultural interest too. So that's been my um, approach to science. It's kind of a what if approach, mm. you know, like what if this was true and taking it forward uh, often to like absurd examples. I mean, one of my favorite of your plays that was in the, the Playwrights Foundations, they are Playwrights Festival, it was on a, it was on a Wonderverse, right? Where there was like yeah. a little, it was a, a universe in a jar basically. Like, yeah. <laughs> who writes that? It's so great. And you kind of are sitting there the whole time going, there's universe on stage. She just put it on stage. It's so brave and theatrical and kind of fabulous. We should be yeah, more science um, sci-fi. Yeah, there should be. I agree. Let's do that. Let's <laughs> how do, we do get that. that? <laughs> um, so, Charlie, like how that. did you find your um, subject matter? How did that come to you, and kind of how did you approach telling that story? Um, I think I, I fall into the oh, I read this story and what um, kind of category. Um, you know, uh, for behind the sheet, it was literally I, I think it was Gawker back when Gawker existed um, that you know sort of. Uh, highlighted that there was a pro that there had been a protest at a statue um, of the man of uh, Dr. J. Marion Sims, um, and I had never heard of him before. And I clicked the article and you know read about this this history of gynecology of slavery, um, and then of doing this work on um, black enslaved black women's bodies. Um, and I was astounded that um, someone who worked to create the speculum a tool that uh, perhaps TMI, I went to the doctor this morning, a tool that was put inside me, <laughs> uh, that I didn't know the history of this tool. Um, and uh, usually when I'm sort of like flabbergasted by something, I, I end up writing about it mostly to try to understand it and to mm -hmm. try to make sense of it um, for myself. Um, and that's sort of how that happened there was a commission opportunity to submit a proposal and, and I submitted it and um you know sort of the rest was history but it really just came from a sense of like oh wow it's, it's crazy to me that I did not know that um and it's crazy to me that there are other folks that don't know that oh well I now have to sort of write about it I had no idea I mean I, I think I probably read that same article and it yeah, but I you know but then it, it didn't yeah the idea that something like that that's such an intimate procedure an intimate tool an intimate device and it has such a dark horrifying right. history and you did so beautifully by kind of switching the focus from the doctor to the women um it's, it's a breathtaking <laughs> play I mean it's Thank it's you. yeah I had to like take some breaks to kind of breathe mm -hmm. <laughs> while listening to it and all of you actually can listen to it LA Theatre Works has an mm -hmm. amazing recorded version where you can experience um the show as well mm -hmm. So Anna, I mean, one of your most famous plays, a beautiful production in New York and in London with Nicole Kidman, Photograph 51. Um, how did you find that story and how did you decide to tell it the way you did? Well, I mean, I'll just say that, uh, you know, if you had told my young self that one day I would be on a panel of playwrights talking about writing science plays, um, I would have been shocked. I was the kind of kid who like, was scared of math and science. I think I routinely cried in math class um, up until I was older than I should admit. 
Um, so this was not a subject that I that I sought out. Um, I was a young playwright. I was living in Washington D.C., and a small theater approached me with a with a commission. Um, I had an agent at the time. It was a five hundred dollar commission um, to write a play about three female scientists none of whom I knew very much about and whose lives really had nothing to do with each other. Um, one And one was Rosalind Franklin. And I decided I was going to take this commission um, in part because it terrified me. Um, the idea of writing about science was, was really scary. Um, and when I began to write this play, um, uh, Rosalind Franklin's story really stuck out to me. I mean, I felt, a, like she was kind of a, I don't know, kindred spirit might be too strong a word, but I, but I connected to her. Um, and, and, I, and it became clear to me pretty quickly in reading about her that, that you could tell a science story without really having to know the science, that you were really talking about people and this was about illuminating people and personalities and dynamics, um, you know, in relationships. Uh, and, you know, it, it, this happens to be a story about collaboration and failed collaboration and, and what those lead to. And, and, you know, in a way it felt like, you know, so I've, sometimes actors who've worked on it have said, it's like, it's like we're talking about theater, you know, it's, it's, it's all, hmm. um, it's all just human stuff. Um, so I think I sort of figured out um, how much of the science I needed to understand to write the thing. And, yeah. and I, I promise you, I know no more than that. Um, and I figured if I could get it, then a, you know, then an audience would be able to, to understand it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's how I came to write That's that. such a smart, uh, you know, level that you have to reach. You have to have enough science. To me, it's making sure that the characters sound like they know what they're talking about. Even Absolutely. if the audience doesn't need to know every turn a phrase, right. it sounds like what astrophysicists sound like. <laughs> right. Right. And then you slow down and explain in some way, however you can manage that exposition <laughs> organically, um, the actual bits of science. And to me, the stuff that, that I found telling it, and I'd be interested in your responses too, is you need to know enough so that the audience can be with you for those eureka moments, for the like, oh, she figured it out. Oh, that's a true, oh, that's false or whatever. Whatever moment that you're trying to put on stage of discovery or revelation or you know, a, a conflict at a head. That's really all the audience needs to know. And then you do lovely talkbacks with smart people at the end and they can explain in detail all the stuff you didn't have time to put in the play. <laughs> so how do you deal with science? I mean, this is a question I always get asked. How do you do the research? How do you put the science on stage so that it sounds human and um, rich enough for an audience to understand? Anybody want to take a crack at that one? Um, I, you know, I, I really like how scientists talk to each other, and I think each discipline has like its own like secret coded language that they use, and like oceanographers talk very differently than high energy physicists, and you know, um, uh, and even within disciplines, like you know, the various climate people talk differently about um, climate issues, and I love, um, I, I mean, just very practically, I love like watching conferences on uh, YouTube, also because uh, you know, nerd. <laughs> Um, but you just get to hear that you get to immerse yourself in the language, the way they're thinking about each other. And like, you know, in terms of t like the exposition part of like explaining the science, it's like it's, scientists are so great because they are always devils advocating, yeah. advocating against each other. And that's just part of their culture. Nobody really minds it. And everybody kind of becomes a, you know, almost a, a, a genial, benign asshole to each other you know like there's like <laughs> there, there can be very argumentative and I think like that's a great way of explaining science obviously mm -hmm. is through those arguments mm -hmm. I think I think because my play was so much about a historical moment a lot of it was just looking into the history of the conversations you know how were um how were doctors looking into um and, and treating women, treating uh, gynecological users, that's my crazy dog, if you heard that barking, um, um, you know, and then, and then sort of, you know, um, for, for um, Behind the Sheet, Jay Marion Sims has an autobiography. Um, so, you know, honestly, reading and seeing mm -hmm. how he wrote and trying to then sort of 
ascertain maybe how he spoke um, versus, you know, um, in the play, you, know, you kind of go between, you know, for lack of better phrasing, the white world and the black world um, mm -hmm. and how then somebody's going to describe um, the conditions can be very, very different, you know, um, and being able to sort of describe, um, you know, the play is about fistulas, describe what a fistula is um, in, you know, in the, a character who is experiencing that versus someone who is looking at it from outside. And, and I think that was sort of an interesting and difficult, um, you know, parallel to sort of to, to balance, um, yeah. you know, but, but thinking about, I'm writing a, another play more contemporary and and now I'm like oh right how do scientists how do scientists speak now so I need to basically I need to watch those conferences on YouTube <laughs> um, and take lots and lots of notes indeed um, I guess I would say two things um, that helped me one was that as I mentioned I had initially had a, a, a commission to write about three scientists and I and I changed my mind you know midway through the process and so I didn't have very much time to write the play um, and so I wrote a first draft very quickly, which meant I couldn't read very much. Mm -hmm. I, I think I read one book maybe when I wrote the first draft of that play. Um, and, and I actually think that was sort of a blessing because you can, I mean, when you were writing about things, especially things you don't understand, um, you can really go deep down the rabbit hole of, in, you know, research. And it sort of stopped me from doing that. I mean, I've since read, you know, other books that have been informed, you know, like later drafts of the play. Um, but I, I actually thought it was useful not to sort of over research. Um, and, yeah. and when I, when I, when I do research, I also, I mean, I take notes, but then I often don't look back at my notes very much. I just, then the things that sort of stick in my mind are the, the things that end up seeming important, or at least were memorable enough for me, um, that, you know, makes it seem like they should make their way into the play. Um, and then the, the other thing I was going to say, notes. <laughs> yeah, right. All notes the play. Write them there. down and never look at that list ever again. <laughs> <laughs> like outlines, you write your outline, mm -hmm. then ignore it. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say is that one, another thing that helped me into, into that play in particular was sort of finding a metaphor at the heart of it. And yeah. I realized, you know, that as I said before, this is a play about collaboration and DNA itself is about, mm -hmm. you know, strands that, collaborate with each other and that's what you know creates the building blocks of life and so once I kind of landed on that metaphor it it, it, it helped me um, kind of understand the play in a bigger way. I was just going to ask about that I think metaphors are huge in in science plays um, and it's trying to find the the way to use the metaphor, the way to elaborate on it, the way that it isn't a metaphor for the characters, but it's a metaphor for the audience um, and the teller. And have you, Gita and Charlie, have you kind of run across that in your science plays as well? Um, yeah, I have. And I think like, I uh, obviously, um, you know, science is so, it's such a tantalizing thing to, uh, almost anthropomorphize it or make it mm -hmm. metaphorical. But I the other thing I really like to do is to take the scientific concepts and see if like uh, you, it can, you can make them resonate throughout the play, um, mm -hmm. either like structurally or um, or as Anna was saying, you know, like it's about, you know, the strands are about collaboration and just having that feeling come out through the play in a more poetic form. So even if people aren't directly saying, uh, you know, uh, metaphorical things like, you know, uh, I feel like a strange particle or something, you know, mm -hmm. um, that there is uh, something maybe strange about the world or, or the way mm. the play feels. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if, I, if I've actively thought of, of metaphor. I think there, there are things that sort of came out in the play kind of like that then my director would be like, oh, like that kind of makes me think of this. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I actually con like was contemplating that. Um, I think I was like, Maybe to to I won't say to a detriment, but I was I was so focused on trying to, to get the story um, as close to quote unquote right as I could, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, and and to you know to to balance both sort of um, perspectives that needed to sort of be in in, in the piece. That uh, I think some of the the metaphor really came later and really came actually in the 
the production process, you know, um, mm. and some of that stuff was more, you know, discovered and, and having lots of conversations with um, the team of people and, and sort of them discovering things that I hadn't really um, actively sat down and thought about <laughs> um, in the same way, uh, I think brought a lot of that sort of that side of the conversation to light. Um, versus in some other plays that like there's a whole play I'm working on that is a whole big metaphor that it's not even doesn't really talk about the science just directly at all but like they're physicalizing what um is being described in um in this one medical condition um and so I feel like that I'm like oh yeah that's all metaphor but for behind the sheet I, I was I was sort of uh I couldn't let that in quite yeah it's interesting because I, I think we don't have a ton of medical plays, medical science plays. And, you know, the Sloan Foundation has done a ton for illuminating science plays, but they specifically exclude stories of medicine, which I was always like, but why? That's like the science of us. That's mm -hmm. really, anyway, so I, I, a part of why I loved your story so much, Charlie, was because it felt all the things I love about science plays, science and history and feminism and, and, and all, all of that, but it also had this kind of bravely medical thing. I mean, you're talking about something, it's not glamorous talking about fistulas no. and talking about, you know, and it's certainly for women, our particular parts have been so vilified and made to be, you know, <laughs> just something we don't talk about. So it, it felt really like what better use of theater than to, to humanize and really dive into that, that world. Um, are, are there scenes from your science plays, ones that you have written, that you particularly love or you're particularly proud of? And maybe tell us how you approached writing it or mm. discoveries you had during a production or a rehearsal or something um, that, that maybe, yeah, can help the folks out there who are writers kind of figure out how to tackle a thing, how to, how to really make it work. Mm. Anybody? I can start with one. I have one play um, about early 20th century astronomy. And this was right before uh, stellar photography was the same as other photography on kind of glass plates. And so these women's jobs is in Silent Sky. Their job is to look at the plates that are pictures of the night sky that are sent to them. And they analyze and figure out the, you know, the location and the luminosity of various stars. and. There's one moment in the second act we discovered where she drops the glass plate and they've talked about how delicate they are the mm. whole time. And, you know, and the sound of that crunch, crunch you know, um, some productions literally have it go all over the stage and some are like very clean and tidy and just have it kind of go, <laughs> so they don't have to clean it up, which I understand. Um, <laughs> but there's something about the sound of that. Um, and it's a play called Silent Sky. So the mm. silence being shattered by this thing it just, and it's such a metaphor for her heartbreak, for her disappointment, for the temporality of things and the um, delicacy of, you know, various things related to science. Um, so that was one of those scenes where I was like, oh yeah, I mean, that has to be timed exactly when she's at that mm. low point, when she has that heartbreak, when she has a revelation of like, oh, this is not going how I want it to go. Um, and combining that with the tool of science that we've been talking about the whole play. So that was one of those things where it was a total accident, but it, it happened once in rehearsal. And I was like, oh, that's the thing. Thank you for messing up so beautifully. <laughs> um, are there any other scenes in your plays that feel that, yeah, that, that you kind of really, yeah, love? I think I um, can go. Okay, great. Thanks, Ida, do you want to go first? Go ahead, Anna. I'll keep thinking. <laughs> okay. Um, the one that 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 came to mind first is a is in a play of mine called Boy, which is another mm. um, Sloan commission. Yeah. Um, uh, and this one is about um, nature and nurture uh, as embodied by this one child who, at birth, um, had a botched circumcision and then was raised as a girl, um, unbeknownst to to him. Um, so, and it's about his sort of journey of understanding and, and starting to figure out who he is, um, and, uh, and accept this thing that happened to him. Um, and, and I, and I guess the, the, the thing that came to mind was there's a, there's a sort of payoff that I find quite satisfying. Um, so it's really about, I, I set up at some point early in the play, this, this 
boy who is now back to being a boy and is and is a man really is a young man and is trying to live his life um and is pursuing a woman um and they have a very tricky relationship and i think at one point he's telling her about um like eating chocolate under the covers when he was a kid uh and she doesn't know i should say she doesn't know that he had this you know 15 long experience 15 year long experience of being a girl Mm. um and so by the end of the play uh, he's terrified to reveal that to her um and also because he does not have uh, a working penis i mean their Mm -hmm. their relationship is quite stunted and difficult for you know many reasons uh, but finally at the end, you know, he's brave enough to tell her, um, and he has this whole long monologue, uh, where he, he explains, um, you know, when his father told him that he was actually born a boy, uh, and he says that they were at the ice cream parlor and, you know, his ice cream was melting on his hands when they went to eat it in the car. And then there's sort of this long silence. Um, and she asks, you know, what flavor, was the ice cream, you know, was it chocolate or so, you know, it's something like that where you sort of know that she is going to accept him yeah. um, without her having to, you know, to say that. It's just sort of call a callback from earlier in the play. And so I've always kind of liked that little payoff. That's beautiful, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Gita, do you want to go? You got uh, one? Yeah, I was thinking, I have, I have two examples too. One is, um, uh, and they both have to relate to, uh, you know, tying science into Hinduism. Mm-hmm. I have a play called uh, Blue God Countdown, where uh, mm-hmm. Hindu gods arrive periodically um, and visit the characters. And mm-hmm. there are several points where um, uh, I think it's Shiva um, mm-hmm. who arrives and starts speaking to one of the characters um, and almost using uh, Vedic uh, chanting mm. and and rhythms, but is saying science is saying like, let me explain to you how big the universe is. Let me tell you about the pressure under the ocean. Let me tell you about the height of these trees and, but all in scientific language. And similarly, um, I just did an adaptation of a one person adaptation of Mahabharata. And when we, which, which is, you know, and we were, it was, we were all, it was all um, very fast paced and talking about the, telling the various tales. Uh, but when we got to the war, I kind of stopped everything and started um, just using numbers to explain how large the, that that actual war and the, the war in Kurukshetra was. And um, at one point, the actor even goes off stage, comes back with like a giant calculator, and starts you know <laughs> doing the math um, just to give uh, the audience a sense of uh, the magnitude and and connecting you know the numbers to what was the, the immense destruction that was about to happen to these characters that they'd gotten to know. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah, yeah combining a, a rhythm like a yeah a, a mythic rhythm with the sounds of science. <clears throat> That's great. I love that. Um, um, Charlie, what about you? Yeah, I uh, I was thinking about this. There's a scene in in behind the sheet. Um, that actually really isn't that science heavy. <laughs> um, you know, you have the the character of Philomena, um, and and she's sort of there's there's um, there's a character of of Lewis who who really loves her and 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 wants to be with her and, and she kind of keeps him um, at an arm's distance and she sort of describes her, you know, how she is feeling, how long it has been. Um, and you know, sort of just like, why? Why do you want to be with me? And um, the entire time, there's a there's a, another character sort of sitting and listening, um, and it, it, it's a moment where she's just like, oh, my, you know, he wants to give her flowers. He wants to. Lewis wants to give Philomena flowers, but she's not taking him. So the other character is like, just take the freaking flowers. <laughs> um, and the the actress who played that character in the, in the first production is a good friend of mine, and so I just always have her voice sort of just saying, take the flowers, because she kind of yells at me that way too. Um, and <laughs> um, you know, and then and then it becomes about these characters sort of connecting, and you sort of see how their relationships have changed over the years. Um, and I always really loved that scene because that that really felt like the the heart of of the of the play in some way. But you know, that it was for that kind of scene that I was writing the play. Yeah. If that makes sense. That's great. I love that. <clears throat> I want to go back to something I, I talked about a tiny bit before, and and put it in your hands to to discuss more about the kind of politics, uh, feminism, and racism, and um, all sorts of biases that come out when you write any history, but certainly histories of of science and medicine. And I wonder how much 
or when that became part of your storytelling or was it the first thing? Um, Cause I, I know that so many of my stories are about <clears throat> women and you know, women any time in the past have bullshit to deal with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so much of the stories are tied into a woman proving herself, proving her worth, proving her ability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I see that in all of your, your, your work as well and kind of how you manage that, think about it. Is it forefront? Is it back? Is it constant? Um, yeah. How did, how does that hit you? Uh, it's constant. <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, um, I think, you know, I, I'm usually, I, I say I kind of became a playwright in part because I, I was an actress first and I was told I, I looked really young and I was always playing moms. And so I wasn't going to get the roles that I wanted. Right. Um, and so in some way there's always, I, I think I'm always sort of writing a play that like in theory, if, you know, um, if someone got sick, I could jump in and do it, <laughs> you know, which, you know, um, um, if I'm, if I'm hundred percent honest, That's super um, smart. I like that. You know, I like that. You know, it hasn't happened. And I actually don't really want it to happen now. Like that fills me with dread, but um, you know, but that sort of was the beginning of it. And I, and I think, you know, um, you know, by, by doing that, by placing someone like myself um, at the center, all mm. of those things are going to come in necessarily. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of unfortunate thing about some of the history and science is that, you know, it doesn't have such a great um, track record with people of color, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with black people. Um, and, you know, that was going to, to come up. And so for behind the sheet, that was always a question. Um, and it was always uh, a debate, you know, um, how I was depicting things, you know, uh, whether or not I was vilifying certain characters or not, you know, the, 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 the questions and the discussions and uh, the emails that I still have in my email, you know, email box just kind of go to show um, how even sort of stepping my foot into this history and perhaps not just saying, oh, it's so great that this person figured a way uh, to, figure out a way to fix fistulas, you know, by also sort of pointing out the the in inherent, you know, racism um, that was a part of that, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it, it's been an interesting experience. Um, but I also, I'm like, that's, that's, those are the questions. Those are the things that, that uh, kind of, you know, they don't, I'm fascinated by it and I'm scared by it. I'm, I'm scared yeah. by that. Um, and that's why I have to write about it. Yeah. How about either Geetz or Anna about this, politics and science on stage? <laughs> I mean, I think uh, similar to Charlie, I think it, it infuses all of the work. And I mean, you know, so much of it is about uh, the agency of the science of the people on stage and like, um, uh, and science uh, or, and how people, particularly people of color are able to do science um, mm -hmm. at all. And whether the things that they say are respected in effect on a wonder verse is very much based on Rosamund Franklin and just that idea of not getting the Nobel prize when you so clearly, <laughs> if you'd if she'd been a man, she would have. Um, and, uh, but, but I think the thing I really learned when we were doing Gila, and I think it had a lot to do with um, a lot of the black women we, we brought in through the um, rehearsal project was, you know, imagining what the characters on stage would think if they came to the play mm -hmm. like would they see themselves would they feel themselves respected um are we telling the story that they um would want to elevate or not uh and um yeah i think that that was like the, that was a a way of um unlocking something for me to writing that play and understanding something about actually the very issues that charlie was talking about with her yeah. play yeah, that was an incredible process and really grateful yeah. to so much of the community that that came in and helped us understand what we didn't understand and <clears> you know, <throat> and um, work to tell what I thought was uh, ended up being a really powerful and beautiful story. Yeah, I'm grateful to those folks. Shout out to Margot Hall. She's one of our yeah, local Bay Area amazing actors who was <clears throat> worked with us on that and um, are incredible yeah. actors for the show too. Yeah. Um, yeah, Anna, what's that? What's that like for you telling this? Uh, I guess I would weigh in and say, um, at least in, in terms of writing Photograph 51, um, I think I was really naive. Um, I mean, for one thing, I didn't think anyone would see this play. 
So I, wa I, I was not really considering the politics of it. I, I certainly wasn't thinking of Rosalind Franklin as any kind of feminist icon or thinking of the play as a particularly feminist play. Um, I mean, in part because Rosalind Franklin did not want to think of herself um, as a woman in science. She wanted to be a person in science, you know, and do her work. Um, so it's been, it's been a really fascinating, eye-opening kind of experience for me to learn that, you know, many will see this play as they want to see it and see it as a, as a feminist play, which is fine by me. Um, but, uh, but it's, I think what I didn't uh, consider was that some of the politics and sort of grievances depicted in that play, um, because it's about real people, and that's always a tricky thing to do. Some of those are still very much alive. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I've had, I'm sure you guys all have had like sort of spirited talkbacks after your play where like scientists are, are still kind of debating the issues, you know, they're, they're people who, who are still alive, who were, um, you know, around in the 50s, and, and some who thought, you know, Rosalind Franklin was was you know had a had a uh, was unfairly um, treated and and others who think that's bullshit um, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean you know so it's it's and there's a there's a James Watson kind of issue too <laughs> um, which <laughs> grows and changes over time um, but I mean I think you know what Gita said about the people in the play if, if they came to see the play how would they feel well so that happened with this play mm. um and uh, and it you know it's it's ter it, that's terrifying um and i guess i mean obviously rosalind franklin could not come see the play which is um the point of the whole play mm -hmm. <laughs> is that she um died too young um yeah. but uh but you know it, it, i'm not sure you should have in your mind what those people would think seeing the play because mm -hmm. otherwise you would be I think so um hamstrung <laughs> I, I think it would be really hard to write if you but I think if they're imagine you know if you know they really won't come <laughs> then you can imagine what yes. they would think if they came they're very you know? dead <laughs> but if but if you're yeah if you're writing real people who might actually come to see your play I think you can't really think about what um they would think or you you'd be stymied this is why I don't want to write about <laughs> people yeah. that are alive Living people, to no, protest. It's, um, I mean, really tricky. It is. What's so interesting, too, about uh, science characters is that um, they don't see themselves as being very political, and scientists mm -hmm. tend to have like a very, like, um, uh, cling to this idea that they have very objective goals. And I, I know a lot of women scientists, and I was among them, uh, who eschewed the idea that any of the identity issues that were so clearly shaping my experience in science were going to actually affecting me, you know. Um, and I think I think that's actually fascinating. I think that's a fascinating characteristic of um, of scientists and something for them to put for or the characters to push against in the play, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's um, getting a lot of love on the comments. When I look over here, I'm looking at my other screen. I'm not looking away from you, checking my, you know, Instagram. Or anything. Um, yeah, it's such, it's, so maybe just backing up because the conversation about writing plays about anything specific, science plays or feminist plays or whatever, always goes back to writing a great play. Like it doesn't actually matter <laughs> um, if the science is really good, if the play um, isn't. And so how, how do you, this is kind of a big question, but how do you define a good play like how when you set out to write something good and meaningful um for you what are the things you think about and or the first batch of things you think about what's important to you and i mean it's kind of a broader question of um yeah what advice would you have to the writers watching hello writers watching <laughs> um, anybody i mean i think for me i think uh creating it a you know you know i believe in theater as a um, an act, an act, an important act within democracy, and so kind mm. of creating a uh, um, transformative uh, experience. And you know, personally, I'm just like I'm, I'm trying not to preach so much the choir, choir as um, trying trying to find ways to move conversation forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I guess if I had to come up with a rubric for what a good play was, it would kind of be somewhere between, you know, transformation and elevation and uh, 
conversation. Awesome. This is not really a hard question. Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, sorry, no, no, you go, Anna. I don't have you go. Go, Anna. Go, Anna. I don't have a great answer, um, <laughs> but I was going to say, you know, I mean, I think, uh, as I said before, you know, I think writing about things that scare you, um, it, that's often valuable because it, you know, it means that there will be something kind of controversial in the play. You know, there's something that's like you're terrified to tackle. Um, but you know, I, I guess the way I kind of start plays is is um if I can kind of like see my way into them and 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 understand you know what about that story moves me um then I know I can write the play you know I mean I've, I've started many many plays that I haven't finished that I I think um you know I just there was like a premise that I found interesting you know and so I would write a few scenes or even half a play and then realize that I didn't know where it was going and it, it wasn't going anywhere um and so you know I think the the good plays are the ones where you I mean this is so obvious but where you see the end you know <laughs> you see you you have a sense in your heart of kind of where it needs to go um and ideally you know that going in but I don't think you always do which is how you sometimes end up with those half-written plays that you Mm -hmm. that you throw away oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah I think um it's it's it feels so a cheat to say but it feels like a feeling like the plays of mine that I I I'm sort of like I think that is a good play <laughs> um are the ones that like at some point you know usually it's an image or it's it's a phrase and I latched onto it and I sort of just let it come out um on the paper and I actually you know I didn't I didn't fuss with it too much until it was clear what the story was and what I was trying to to show and that image um you know sort of understanding what that image that sort of came to me was about um and the plays that I struggle with are when I I, I can't figure out what the image is <laughs> or I've been sort of forced an image <laughs> mm. or you know or something like that you know um and those are the plays that even I sort of I can look at I can read and I can be like yeah I don't I don't know if I think that's one of a, a good play of mine <laughs> like maybe it hits other things but but I actually I, I don't know if, if that's if that's a good play um and and sort of in, in my mind if I'm if I'm being uh truthful to myself um but the, yeah, and, and, and I'm trying to think about other folks' plays and it's honestly, it's, it's like, there are plays I've gone to have been like, I have no idea what is happening here, but like I'm experiencing this and I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm like, to me, that is a good play, even though I'm like, I also don't know what's happening. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, you know uh, as much as sometimes, you know, you read, you're reading a play and it like, it just hits all the things, you know? But again, it's, it's this feeling that, that I'm left with that I, I wish I could put into better words. I think for me, it's, it's emotional, right? There's this... This, especially when you talk about something like science on stage where we expect it to be so intellectually driven mm -hmm. and so heady, mm -hmm. um, you have to remember that to Anna's point or all of our points, mm -hmm. it's people. It's mm -hmm. a story about people and people get their hearts broken and are betrayed and are um, overly passionate and declare love and you know all of that. And if the play doesn't have room for that kind of human emotion instead of just we did it, it's correct, <laughs> you know, um, then it's, it's gonna feel like an, kind of a walk through science or a walk through history, but not a walk in somebody else's shoes, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one of the things in answering my own question that I just <laughs> randomly came up with and wasn't expecting to ask. Um, that to me, I think is one of the most important things is, and, and it's the combination of it, like Charlie, what you're saying about that feeling, for me, that feeling combined with Anna's point about knowing the end Mm -hmm. combined with with Gita's point is like it's it sinks and you can kind of get that like oh yeah oh mm -hmm. I can write this okay oh yeah oh man she's gonna get so mad here <laughs> and have a great monologue and a door slam oh fabulous can't wait to write that scene <laughs> um but trying to figure that out and I mean to me with with science that's combining the research that you do and just narrowing it down what is the discovery what is the thing you need to know already to understand the discovery? And what, where do we start? Like what time period are we in? What hasn't been discovered yet that we need to kind of reference like, there's no cell phones or, you know, like whatever. Mm -hmm. um, like laying that groundwork so the audience can really enjoy the ride of the discovery and the emotion without having to be handheld the whole time and being like, let's pause for a lecture on <laughs> basic anatomy. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
So is there any like last minute advice? We only have a couple minutes left um, that hour flew by. And I know, let's see, actually there's a few questions. <laughs> I, I had wonder. a fabulous pun about how much <laughs> chemistry we have. <laughs> love it, yes. Yeah. Love a science Zoom chemistry. Pun. That's great. <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to highlight something Anna said right at the beginning of the, um, when she was talking about how she was applying for her class and mm-hmm. so she didn't have a place so she submitted a poem. I was like, oh, I wish I had been like that when I was younger. Like, I just never understood that um, even though these doors seem closed to me, they, they were actually just openable, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and that uh, you find a way around them. Um, and I think like not waiting for permission to show your work or do your work is really important. So, you know. That's great. Um, take inspiration from Anna. Submit your poem if you have to. Submit your poem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like, don't... Uh, I always joke, my, my, my dad was like a history major and he used to give history lectures just like over dinner. And I would be like, I'm never, I hate history. It's not happening. Um, you know, and then clearly have sort of stepped into a place where I'm like, ooh, looking at history is, is, is interesting and complicated. And obviously I wanted to live there. Um, and don't let like your own um, sort of prejudices in that sense. <laughs> You know, like I was like, I don't like history. So why would I write a play about this moment? You know? Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that like, I, I didn't at the time writing the commission did not think of it as history. It was only later when I like started opening history books. And I was like, oh, I've sort of done this thing that I don't think I'm very good at. Um, uh, you know, um, and I'm, I'm sort of glad that I, I, I did, didn't have that thought. So um, if you feel like, again, if you feel like you, you know, history, or you're not a science person, you're not any of these things, like, you know, there is a perspective and there is probably a, a point of view um that would be great to have on stage um through your eyes yeah great point i remember well i remember when at my sort of grad school orientation one of the professors uh, stood up and said that playwrights need to be like athletes and i actually think she meant literally like we needed to sort of stay in shape um and we all kind of made fun of that idea but i i actually think there is a kind of relevant um, connection to, to athletes in that I think playwrights or what I'm still sort of learning to or trying to do is to recover quickly, you know, sort of put things behind you, let mm. them go and keep going because there are a lot of obstacles and rejections and terrible things <laughs> happen along the way. And, you know, plays you write that you write half of and then decide they probably have no future and, and I, I mean and I, I can get sort of stuck in the frustration of those things um, mm-hmm. and I think that you know the world is not um, reflecting on your uh, you know moments of, of, uh, of pain so so really you know uh, it's just about writing the next play. Um, That's and- such a good thing to just I mean, it's like reviews or rejections of applications you've mm-hmm. submitted or yeah, any version yeah. of failure is like, doesn't have to be if you don't think of it as failure. You're just like, yeah. yeah and that's, that's inevitable. That that's, that's, that's part of the journey. Everyone yes. gets lots of rejections along yeah. the way. I think we can all. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And I think actually it's really interesting with science plays um, because most of the people who work in the theater are artists and come from the arts. They actually have a lot of emotion, like particularly if there's a lot of math in a play, they sometimes get like a little, like they have issues around it. And like, um, sometimes you feel like that's reflecting on you as a playwright and it might just be your job to work it through them with it and um, not, and just be resilient about it to Anna's point. Yeah, Yeah. that's so great. Mm -hmm. Um, So in the last couple minutes, thank you, thank you, thank you for this really exciting, inspiring talk. Um, how can we find more of your things um, to listen to? I mentioned uh, Charlie's Behind the Sheets at LA Theater Works, which you can look up. I'll put the link to that in the, um, the chat so you can find it easily. Um, what's, how is the best way to access your work? Um, how do they find your plays to read or listen to or whatever? Anybody have some fun stuff to drop? Uh, I just did a Zoomlet with uh, SF Playhouse, which was a live rehearsal of um, a play of mine called The Mommy Assumption, which is based on uh, some social science research from the early, uh, or the late 1990s. 
Um, and then you can find that on YouTube, I think now. Awesome. Um, and, you know, just reach out to me. I'm on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Based on, based and your on. website's gorgeous. Lots of pictures. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, 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 I keep website. I don't know if you can, you can look at my website. It's your website, too. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. I was going to say my website's very, uh, well, I don't know if it's up to date during the pandemic. <laughs> I'm not sure I've, I've done that, but usually up to date. And um, I my, my two signs plays are also LA Theater Works recordings. Mm-hmm. And those oh, are that's cool. Right. Um, and awesome. Uh, Photograph 51, we just finished recording it for Audible. Um, oh, so cool. it will, uh, following in the footsteps of, of your play, Lauren, um, there was a lot a lot of reference to various things that worked well when you were okay. recording <laughs> recording your <laughs> play. Um, so uh, that will be out who knows when, but um, probably sometime this year. And then, yeah, awesome. my website has. Great. Any Same other thing. stuff for you, Charlie? Yeah, no, so my website. Um, you know, uh, I have, I think I still have some plays on a new play exchange. Um, I had a moment where I was like, everything's, all my plays are terrible and I took all them off, but I think I put some of them back on. Uh, <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> um, um, and then behind the shade is on LA Theater Works as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, you fabulous artists. Um, this was such a joy. Um, yeah, thanks mm-hmm. uh, everybody. I'll go through and read some of the comments and respond and, um, yeah, reach out, see these incredible plays and write your own and tell us mm-hmm. about them because I can't wait to see what y'all are writing. Yeah. Thank you, Lauren. This is yeah, really thank fun. you. Yes. Thanks yeah, for having great. us, Lauren. And thanks for hosting HowlRound. Thanks.